We in the West owe a debt to the Muslim world that can, can never be fully repaid. Despite our common religious and spiritual root, we have thanked them with century of mistrust, the brutality of the crusade, and the imperial top takeover that was conducted with callous indifference to the need of the people we explored. I want to add something also to the contribution, which is part of our, our daily life, which we never understand it or know its root. For example, the first university in the world, real university, established, established by a Muslim woman, Fatima Fahriya, which is in Morocco fast, and we call it the Karawiyin. Karawiyin University was the magnet for all the European students from all over Europe to come and study logic, philosophy, because remember, the church at that time stopped teaching philosophy or logic. Philosophy of the ancient Greek dead was dead in the West. So they have to come to study in the Karawiyin. And also one of the very few people know about it, that when the church it didn't like the teaching of the Islamic University, tried to stop the student from learning the curriculum of the Muslim University. So the student in Paris went for six years of strike. They refused because they want to study philosophy and Islamic you know, uh, logic and what the Islamic University is giving. So in the, in the end, uh, Thomas Aquinas came to Paris to negotiate with them and talk to them. And in the end, he himself started understanding the importance of science and religion together. And he was influenced by a verse, which we call in Arabic Ibn Rushd. And later on, he had his book published. Also, I find it very strange and, and really, I, I couldn't believe it. I saw a, a letter from King George II in, uh, in, uh, in 1028. He sent, he sent a letter to the ruler of the Muslim Spain, uh, the Andalus, asking him if he can send ladies from the royal family, some of the princess, to go to, to, uh, to Spain or to uh, Andalus to learn so they can bring back the Islamic learning to England. Uh, his, his, his letter is, exists. If anybody would like, I will send it. I will show you the, the letter. It's also another thing. All of us, we know that this is the month for graduation. And everybody graduates wearing black robe and a hat. A lot of people, they don't know where this tradition came from. This is a tradition came from the Islamic universities that time because the graduates used to wear the koftan, the black koftan, and the turban. And thus, the European took that. And now we see it with the rope and, and uh, You know, this is for example. Uh, yeah. Now, another thing, we all drink coffee. And a lot of people, they don't know that the beginning of coffee, when it started, actually started because of religion. Because coffee invented actually in Yemen. The Sufis in Yemen, they want to stay late so they can worship. So they came with the idea of roasting their coffee and grinding and make the coffee. So this way they can stay late. And of course, the coffee later on spread all over and a lot of the West know it through the Turkish coffee. But it was original. So there is a lot of contribution of Islam in our daily life. Unfortunately, there is insomnia about when it comes or you know, trying to ignore it, but there is a lot if you go to the internet and look. So, another thing, when we're talking about spirituality, one of the things I would like to talk about is my birthplace, Mecca. I was born in Mecca, uh, which is the west, the west part of Saudi Arabia. And the city of Mecca, of course, is a very famous city for its spirituality and uniqueness. One of the things it makes unique is that you not can have people, a person like me coming to talk to you because very few Saudi goes out. Anyway, um, my family actually, from my father's side, I'm the descendant of Omar ibn Khattab, which is the second Khalifa of Islam, the most, the mighty, you know, second most important. From my mother's side, she descended of the Prophet Muhammad. And also my family inherited the same job of the, the time of the Prophet which is hosting all the pilgrims. So I live that life. I live the, you know, the pilgrim and Mecca and the spirituality of Mecca. And I tell you, spiritual Mecca, Mecca, you will never gonna see a, a city like it. It's a very unique. It's a 
spiritual truth there is amazing. So what Mac, what make Mecca special? Why people going to Mecca? Very few reasons. First of all, people go to Mecca because of Abraham. When in the Bible, you have it in the Bible. If you go back to, to the Bible and look, God when He uh, had His son Ishmael, when He uh, Ishmael, God asked him to go and take his wife Hagar to go to the valley of Bacca, which is another name for Mecca. So he, still, he took his wife with the, with the child is still very little. So he went to Mecca and he left her. And she was asking him, why you leave me? He said, I've been ordered to do that. So, and then the angel looked at her and he said, this is what's written for you, you have to stay here. So she took the baby, it's a dry valley, there is nothing, because Mecca is not a beautiful city. It's a dry valley. But the beauty is something different. It's an abstract beauty. It's a spiritual beauty. So she stayed, and when she had the, 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 the baby, she got thirsty. And the baby was thirsty crying, and she had no water. So she started running between two hills, which we call Safa and Marwa. She was running for seven times, and then when she came the seven time, she found the, the water under the feet of the little, little kid, the baby, where we call it the, beer, uh, the well of Samson. So the well of Samson, it is, life started with Mecca and that. So Hagar became the matriarch of the valley. And then later on, other tribes came. So, but her tenacity and her devotion and her patience, which make Mecca, is very important. I want you to see women in the history of, of Mecca, the history of women. So that's, that's one. So later on, Abraham came, and he was ordered to build a house for God, and this is what we call the Kaaba, and the Kaaba means the key. So he built it, and when he built it, he was so happy he was trying to worship God and trying to praise God, so he kept going around it for seven times. So this is what in, in, in the Kaaba. Now, outside Mecca is also, there is a hill, we call it Arafah. And Arafah in Arabic, it means recognition. And Arafah is, we believe that when Adam and Eve descend from heaven, they met there in the, in the mountain of Arafah. And when uh, Eve died, she was buried in the city of Jeddah. That's what the name Jeddah is coming, coming from. So, so this is, give you a little bit of spirituality of Mecca. Now, when the people come for the pilgrims, it is something unique all over, the, you know, you, you will never see something like that because it's, it's really uh, changed me when I was a little kid. I remember standing in, in my door and I feel like a wave of white coming and keep coming and keep coming. I saw people coming in the Mecca. They start straight away invoking God. And you will hear, oh God, we're coming here. We, we, we worship you. You're the only one. And you see wave after wave and after wave and people coming. And they only speak one language, Arabic. It's the language of the Quran. Only repeat the language of the Quran. So really, when you look at it, you feel that this is the kingdom of God. This is kingdom where people come. And when they come, how they dress? They dress in their coffin. And the, the, what they wear for a child. When a Muslim child wo uh, born, he wore two pieces of white, dressed in two pieces. And when a person died, he also wrapped with two pieces of white. So they come with their coffin and the, the clothes where they're going to be born again. So when they come to, to Mecca, it's come for death and rebirth. Death of the old person and rebirth of the new person. And when they're there, you cannot use your temper. You cannot say anything bad. If you say anything, your, your pilgrim is done. You have to be the best you can because you are in the land of God. You are in his kingdom. You have to be the best. And you will see people, it, it is amazing, day and night, Mecca never, never stop. People coming, and then they go to the, to the haram, and the, you know, to the mosque, and to do it again. And we never see the mosque empty, always full. And the amazing thing used to amaze me is when the time of prayer comes. Suddenly you have three million people going and coming, and, and suddenly the prayer start, and, and the, the, the azan, or the calling for prayer starts. And suddenly what you see is three million people stop, line up, 
Everybody line up. It's like an army. Somebody line up a general line. You don't need general. It's the love of God and the commitment. You will see people lining up to pray and facing the, the Kaaba. You will see shopping <coughs> clothes and everywhere you go, people put their mat and the whole place, it doesn't matter because the mosque doesn't take everybody. Everywhere, people stand there and they do the prayer and they all together up and down. And the whole city is quiet. You only hear them walking in the name of God <coughs> and you, 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 you listen to that. So that was so impressive for me as a little girl that and I always, even when I go to Mecca, I always look and I say, can't believe it, that people line up like that, you know, it doesn't matter. And you find, and by the way, women and men mix, because I know in the mosque we don't have women in, in, in a separate and men separate. But in the Hajj there is nothing separate. You Everything women do. And then you go, people go to Arafah, which is the, the mountain of Arafah, you know, this, the hill. And this is, it's in, in the desert. Before, the, before they go, it is a piece of desert. The time they go, it's a tent city, old tent city. And then the people start going to the mountain. And I tell you, if you're talking about resurrection, you have to see that, that, that view. People standing there in the looking, everybody looking toward heaven. Everybody was invoking the name of God, supplication. And it is amazing. And I tell you, is it easy? No, it is very hard. Mecca is a very hot place. It's not an, you know, uh, an easy to live. There is no air condition, there is nothing. But that's what made something to kill all the uh, uh, earthly, or uh, the, the worldly uh, thing. Because when you come, you cannot come with a watch, you cannot come with the jewelry, you can And one of the things, you see the people equal. You don't know who's rich, who's poor. They were sandals and two pieces of white, they're all the same. Everybody is the same. And, 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 and it, it is amazing that it is, you don't see the classes, you don't see any of, of those things you see. And people understand that. So equality, and it's like, and the thing, second thing which amazes me, you see people from all over the world, black, brown, white, every day they mingle, it's like, International conference of the whole world come to that place to only worship God. So it is a very interesting experience, uh, you know. And you stay the whole the, the whole week, and then you will, if people go after Mecca, they go to Medina, which is the prophet uh, prophet tomb there, to go and visit Medina and and then come. Okay. So okay, I'm gonna be taking questions for five minutes. Anybody has any question? You have a great opportunity to ask. Yes. Um, well, you mentioned equality in, in, in the Hajj, but um, could you answer uh, your, your opinion? Why is it that Saudi Arabia does not have equality today for uh, women, for LGBTQ people? for Christians and other other non-Muslims. Okay, if we go, for example, let me take the second first thing about Christian. The Prophet, when he was in Medina, a delegation, Christian delegation came to him in Medina from, uh, from uh, Abyssinia. So when the time of the prayer came, they said, we want to pray outside. He said, no, you stay in my mosque, you pray. So the Prophet went out and gave them the time to pray. So Islam is always found, we always consider Christian and Jews are the people of the book. Now, when we come to Saudi Arabia, because I want you to understand, religion is different and the people follow religion are different. Two different things. We are people, we are weak, we are, have our misconcept. I mean, you know, you know that if, if you come to the, 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 the history of Christianity here, you will be shocked. Uh, every religion have the good, the bad, and ugly. And every religion, uh, that's why one of the reasons, actually, we have to look at the religion itself. Not to judge religion by the people followers, because you're doing yourself this favor. Uh, this, you know, you're, not, you're not learning anything, because that's not reality. But, and every religion have that. It's, it's not Islam, it's not something to do with Islam. Now, Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia, they call themselves Islamic, but they are not following Islam. Islam, Islam, if you look, 
I hope we have an opportunity another time to talk about women. First religion gave women more things than any other religion. Gave the woman the, the right to divorce. Gave the woman to inherit. Muslim women keep it is, its name. Women can vote because they voted for the Prophet when he went to Medina. So Islam gave women a lot of rights. Now, what happened is, now we see the cultures overwhelm the religion. That's why you find, if you look at a lot of the converts from all over, they are women. 75% of converts in Europe because they say Islam is a feminist. But real Islam, not. And by the way, before I forget, because of what I'm saying, I, I left a gift for every one of you. I have a bag which has the Quran in it because this is one of the things a lot of people unfortunately talk about Quran and they never read it. Because the Quran is amazing when you read you or completely you you see there something you never heard. Because Quran talking about you know, morality, talking about nature, talking about equality, talking about women, family life. There is a lot of things which are wonderful for us as a Muslim. We know what is love. So I hope if you want you can pick a bag, it has some flyer, it has some idea to give you if you want. And I hope this this uh, you know uh, occasion it will come for us to learn about each other religion not to judge it by the media but to judge it from its own source and i hope that we can read each other books and we read each other thing from the people themselves not from the outside to the media because i tell you if you read the quran you see that what you hear is completely different it doesn't exist even in the quran so so that's one of the one minute Anybody have one question for one minute? <laughs> <laughs> well, if no one else has a question, I just didn't hear where you said the first university was founded. Where, where right, founded by because at that yeah at that time where in Morocco and uh, in Fez in Fez in okay. Fez the Karawi okay. and after that the spread of a, a university all over uh, the, the the Muslim world. And Europe didn't know university until later they covered the Islamic system, yeah. Okay. So that's uh, interesting. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. And now, Dr. Farha. Let's give you Good afternoon, everyone. Hello. I also wanted to express my gratitude to the Hindu Temple and all of those friends who made this possible. It's really great to be here. I'm going to find me just back a little bit. Okay. So thank you for this enlightening uh, speech, Ariel. Uh, it was wonderful. And indeed, uh, Islam has made significant contributions to our civilization. I was thinking of the word algebra. It's uh, you know, uh, algorithm from Al Kharazmi, which is also an Iranian who created algorithm. Alcohol was created. By <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, there have been lots of contributions by Islam, and uh, uh, and it's important for us to all remember that. Now, um, I'd like to share with you some thoughts about um, uh, the last point that you mentioned, about how culture tends to change religion, actually. Because uh, the way I think about the question that was posed, what my religion can do to make the world a better place, um, uh, I'd like to emphasize what can I do as a follower of religion to make the world a better place. Because religion is really a concept, it is just sitting there. And the extent to which a religion can change the world is the degree to which we as individual can adopt those wonderful principles that she mentioned and implement it in our lives, practice it in our daily activities, and make sure we are the best representative of the religion we're representing, especially in Mecca, in churches, in synagogues, in wherever we are. So the Baha'i faith really emphasizes, first and foremost, individual transformation. Essentially, what it is that we can do as individuals to make the world a better place. 
So, as I was thinking about, okay, so exactly what is it that the Baha'i Faith um, teaches for individuals who change? You know, the Baha'i Faith basically emphasizes the concept of unity and equality, as, as was mentioned, <laughs> meaning that we see the world pretty much uh, the opposite of the way it is being seen today. Today we are living in a world that is divided, or at least the division part is emphasized so much more, you know. We divide the world between men and women, you know. As an economist, I know that basically for similar jobs, women earn about 70 cents to the dollar when men earn. Uh, we divide the world between black and white. We divide the world between Muslims and Christians and Jews and, and basically warring factions. We make religion, which was supposed to be the cause of peace, we make it the cause of war. And in the Baha'i literature says, if religion is the cause of disunity, it is better to have no religion at all than the religion that actually causes disunity. So we see that even language sometimes causes disunity and hatred. And unfortunately, we hear a lot of language today, and in the past, God knows, several decades, but especially recently, language of hatred, language that incites violence. And all of these are basically individuals. These are individuals who are uh, expressing their own beliefs in one way or another. So the first starting point for us to actually change ourselves is to try to remove every stain of difference. And by difference, I mean these artificial differences uh, from our thoughts. Now, there is a reality, and the, real, the reality is we are all diverse. We are all different. I mean, I'm just looking at the, the way we are dressed today, even though it's very hot. It is actually a beautiful scenery. We see you know, men and women, different colors, with different heights and all that. And that diversity is, in fact, what makes our lives a more a richer life, a more rewarding life, a more prosperous life. Okay? But beneath all these differences, we are all humans. And that is really what sometimes we lose sight of. So the Baha'i Faith, while it believes in the concept of unity, we believe in unity and diversity. In other words, we celebrate a diversity, which is all the appearances that we have, underneath of which, which are essentially human beings. Human beings with the same sentiments, the same emotions, the same values. You know, we, we cry when we are sad, we laugh when we are happy, we basically are, we all of us, no matter what religion we are, you know, the essence of all of these religions are, are one and the same, according to Baha'i Faith. We all believe in honesty, truthfulness, fortitude, uh, justice. We all believe in all of that. Okay? So, so the question ultimately is, how can we reflect that? And the first step for that is to try to see each other as ultimately one human being. Okay? And the second principle that the Baha'i Faith teaches is for each individual to seek the truth for himself or herself.